let us pray. Almighty God, you are better and able, more able to answer our prayers than we are to believe <clears throat> that you answer them. Cause us to ask with a much better condition of mind and heart to ask those things that are pleasing in your sight and in a way that's pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 6 of Advent Hymn 60. To God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, three in one. Praise, honor, might, and glory be from age to age eternal. Well, we turn to a life of Theodoret of Cyrus, C-Y-R-R-U-S. -R -R it's easy to get him <coughs> confused with <coughs> um, Theodore Mopsuestia. Uh, and we've been over this in another series, but we'll go through this, guys, this writer's uh, introduction to Theodore, or Theodoret. The author of the following history was born at Antioch about the year 387. I think we said other, earlier that it was like 390, 95. His parents had long been childless, and it related that much prayer was offered especially by Macedonia, a hermit, that a son might be born to them. Hence, when at length in answer to the prayer the child was granted, the name Theodoratus was conferred upon him, signifying given by God or gift of God. Little is known respecting his childhood and early youth, except that his mother, who seems to have been a remarkable character, dedicated him to God from his very cradle. According to these accounts, he was placed in a monastery at age seven, where he studied theology and sciences under Theodorus of Mopsuestia and St. John Chrysostom. Certain it is that much of his life was devoted to study, for it is evident from his works that he was a very learned man, conversant with classical and theological literature and acquainted with several languages beside his own, which was the Syriac. It might be noted that he would have been well acquainted with Tatian's Dia Tesseron. He entered upon the work of the ministry at a very tender age. For he was but a child when he was appointed to be one of the public readers of Scripture. His parents, who were persons of rank and affluence, died when he had scarcely attained manhood leaving him in possession of a splendid inheritance. He, however, despised the gifts of fortune and chose a life of voluntary poverty. He renounced his land and his honors and distributed all that he had possessed among the poor. Reserving nothing for himself but his clothes, which were of very inferior quality. The next years of his life were spent in retirement in a monastery about 30 leagues from Antioch. For 23, he was compelled almost by force to relinquish his solitude and to enter upon the duties of the Episcopal office. He was ordained by the Bishop of Antioch and sent to govern the Church of Cyrus in Syria, Euphratensis, with with its 800 villages. <clears throat> the new field of labor offered many discouragements, yet the self-denying and zealous spirit of Theodore soon changed the whole aspect of affairs. Although on his first appointment, the diocese was full of Arians, Macedonians, and Eunomians, and other heretics, yet in the year 449, not one heretic could be found throughout the whole region nor were his laborers confined to his own diocese, where pagans and Jews from distant countries constantly resorted to him, and he publicly confuted all the arguments and objections which they could advance against Christianity. He attributed his success to prayer, and particularly those persevering supplications of James the Hermit. Theodore was active in promoting the temporal welfare of his flock, he greatly beautified the city of Cyrus, which was but a small and almost deserted town when he fixed his residence in it. He built an aqueduct and a canal to supply the former deficiency of water. He likewise repaired the baths, 
and erected public galleries into bridges in the city. His whole public life seems, seems to have been one of ceaseless exertion. The rage of controversy so characteristic of medieval history interrupted the useful and dignified tenor of his existence. About 430 AD, he became involved in the dispute concerning the heresy of Nestorius, whose cause he espoused. The distinguishing tenet of Nestorius was his refusal to give the Virgin Mary the title Theotokos, the mother or mother of God. That Theodore should have sided with this heresiarch can only be accounted for upon the supposition that he did not perceive that, unlike most of the disputes of the period, this heresy was not a mere quibble about words, but involved the doctrine of no less importance than the divinity of God, the Son of God. Theodore uniformly and strenuously adhered to this doctrine, although he rejected this particular term, Theotokos. Most probably his conduct in rejecting that term, while he maintained the thing signified, was mainly, if not wholly, attributable to the friendship which had long subsisted between him and Nestorius, and to the personal peak which had arisen between him and St. Cyril, the principal opponent of this heresy. In 431 AD, the Council of Ephesus was convened by Emperor Theodosius for the purpose of allaying the dissensions which the Nestorian heresy had excited in the church. At this council, Nestorius was excommunicated and his heresy condemned. Several of his most zealous partisans, among them was Theodoric, were deposed from their ecclesiastical offices. The disputes, however, still continued with unabated acrimony, and it was not till AD 35 that Theodore was induced by the entreaties of certain holy brethren to become reconciled with the hostile party. He then renounced the defense of Nestorius and was accordingly reinstated to his bishopric. The remainder of his life was not spent in tranquility. He soon became involved in a fresh controversy with Dioscorus, the successor of St. Cyril in the See of Alexandria. Theodora was accused of maligning the memory of St. Cyril. Another cause of the dispute was that Theodore vehemently opposed the Eutychian heresy, which Dioscorus is firmly upheld. The heresy of Eutychus was directly opposite that of Nestorius, <clears throat> for while the latter denied the divine nature, was truly united to the human nature in Christ in one person, the former denied that the two natures in Christ remained distinct. In, Theodora, in controversy, Theodore suffered a second defeat. Dioscorus raised up enemies against him in Constantinople accused him of propagating heresy in the church and of teaching that there are two sons. Theodosius, the younger, received these calumnies without examination. He signed the deposition of Theodore and forbade his quitting Cyrus. This mandate was pronounced in the year 447. Theodore was then at Antioch. He quitted the city without saying farewell to anyone and according to this sentence, retired to Cyrus, where he remained till 450, wholly occupied in literary li labors and in writing letters of self-justification. One of these letters was addressed to Dioscorus, but no regard was paid to it. On the contrary, Theodora was public and publicly anathematized in Alexandria, and fresh complaints against him were laid before the emperor. Soon after, another council was held at Ephesus, at which Dioscorus presided, and here Theodore was excommunicated. Theodore appealed to St. Leo, the bishop in Rome, <clears throat> with a long letter in which he recounted the service which he had rendered to the church, referred to his writings as containing proofs of his orthodoxy, 
and complained of the injustice of the council in condemning him unheard and during his absence. In 450, he obtained permission from Theodosius to quit Cyrus and to retire to a monastery. Theodosius died the same year, uh, 450, and was succeeded by Marcion, Marcion, who had married his sister, Pul Pulcheria. Marcion <clears throat> recalled Theodoret at the instance of St. Leo and being the Council of Chalcedon. Here the enemies of Theodore raised loud clamors against him, recommenced their accusations, and insisted on pronouncing anathema against Nestorius. Theodore desired rather to explain his own doctrines than to anathematize his friend. At length, overpowered by the numbers of his enemies, he explained, exclaimed anathema to Nestorius and to all who do not confess that the Virgin Mary is the mother of God. <clears throat> nice guys, these Greeks, huh? Upon this compliance with the demands of the council, he was formally reinstated in his Episcopal divinity, dignity. The few remaining years of his life seemed to have been passed in retirement. He's thought to have died in about 458, probably in his 70th or 80th year of age. Even after his death, his enemies renewed their attacks and again called his orthodoxy into question. His works were condemned as heretical at the Fifth General Council. According to the almost unanimous decision of posterity, his sentence was unjust. For from his earliest youth, he had been diligently instructed in the doctrines of the Nicene Christian faith. And throughout his life, he invariably... <clears throat> adhered to the principles of the Hamaousians, and those who maintain the consubstantiality of the three divine persons in the Trinity. The condemnation of the council referred to those points wherein he was blameless, while the real errors of his doctrines escaped undetected. The defectiveness of his views, especially with respect to justification, adoption, and regeneration may however, be easily detected by all who feel inclined to peruse his voluminous writings, and at the same time to search the scriptures as to whether these things be so. That sounds like a Presbyterian view. The most considerable of the works of Theodore is his commentary on the Bible. The first part of his commentary is formed, arranged in the form of question and answer, and those passages are only proposed for elucidation, which were considered difficult of interpretation by the author. The literal and most obvious sense of scripture is generally adhered to throughout the work. Yet some singular opinions are occasionally advanced. For instance, the spirit of God, which is stated to have moved upon the face of the waters, is here represented as signifying only in the air and a supposition equally untenable was introduced to there being two heavens, namely the heavens properly so folk called in the firmament, which, says Theodore, God made a fluid substance of the water after he condensed it and rendered it solid. Our author reduces the intemperance of Noah as a proof of the previous sobriety of his life and asserts that he was in ignorant of the inebriating property of wine. He acquits Jacob of falsehood and deceit and passing himself off for his older brother <clears throat> on the ground that having purchased the right of primogeniture, he was in truth the firstborn son. In the same spirit, he says that Rachel was merely actuated by her anxiety to deter her father from idolatry when she purloined his idols. Although Theodore has generally been, been generally accused of being too bold in his metaphors, some of his illustrations seem particularly happy. For instance, in the answer to the 12th question on Exodus, what am I to understand by God's having hardened Pharaoh's heart? Theodore, after giving some explanation on the subject, illustrates it in the following way. 
The sun is said to melt the wax and to harden mud, although it possesses only the property of giving heat. So the patience and goodness of God produce two contrary effects in different individuals, being useful to the one and rendering the other more guilty. Hence it is said that some are thus converted and others hardened. Select passages in each successive book from Genesis to Psalms are expounded by means of question and answer in the mode mentioned above. But in the commentaries on the Psalms and succeeding books, Theodore has adopted a form of exposition analogous to the method pursued by Henry Scott and other well-known commentators. We possess his commentaries on every book in the Old Testament, except that on Isaiah, of which only some fragments have been preserved. In the elucidation of the New Testament, he seems to have omitted the Gospels. The Acts, the Catholic Epistles, and Revelation, confining himself solely to the Epistles of St. Paul. <clears throat> the whole work is valuable as affording a clear view of the mode in which Scripture was usually handled by the theologians of the 5th century and of the interpretation most commonly attached to them by controverted passages. The other writings of Theodore and the editions of his works are usually arranged in nearly the following order, Ecclesiastical History in Five Books. It was written before the death of Theodosius the Younger, from Book 5, Chapter 36. Theodoret speaks of him as reigning. <clears throat> Theodosius died July 29, 450, and the history probably completed the same year. It comprises a period of 105 years, namely from 324, when Constantine the Great, having become master of the East, began to oppose the Arian heresy, which had then but recently risen, to 429, according to some authors, 428, so that part of his history may be called a narrative of Theodoret's own times. It was intended to be supplementary to the ecclesiastical history of Socrates and Sodzaman, both of which were written about 450. <clears throat> the author also designed to make it a continuation of the ecclesiastical history of Eusebius, for he takes up the chain of events from the very point at which Eusebius broke off. Many important events, which are omitted by Socrates and Sodzaman, and which would not otherwise have been transmitted to posterity, are recorded by Theodore. He's preserved many particulars relative to the life of Athanasius and of the Eastern bishops, particularly those of Miletius, Flavian, and Eusebius of Samosata. And he throws light on various circumstances which, but for him, would have created much doubt in obscurity in our knowledge of the period. It also means of this history that we now possess some of the most important documents of the fourth century, such as the synodical epistles, the original letters of Arius, of emperors, and other celebrated persons. The crying evil in the history of Theodore is the total omission of all chronology and even of chronological order. Among the anachronisms and errors contained in it may be specified the following. Theodore makes Eusebius of Nicomedia, the successor of Alexander, Bishop of Constantinople, whereas Eusebius succeeded Paul. He places the election of St. Ambrose at the commencement of the reign of Valentinian, although it took place 10 years after the accession of that emperor. He places the sedition of Antioch after the massacre at Thessalonica, but the sedition occurred in 388, and the massacre not until 390. He also confounds the siege of Nisibis by the Persians in the year 350 with another siege which took place in 359. These errors, <clears throat> however, do not affect the intrinsic value of the work. The history is, according to the learned Phocius, superior to those of Socrates and Sodzaman, being written in a style more consonant with the subject and containing little that is superfluous. 
The history entitled Philotheus is a record of the lives of about 30 anchorites, with some of whom Theodoret was personally acquainted. It consists chiefly in an account of the almost incredible austerities which they practiced and of the miracles which they wrought. For our author, like all theologians of the period, was a firm believer in miracles. Several cases, even of women, are adduced who sequestered themselves from the world and lived in a state of perpetual bodily mortification. He instances in particular an interview he had with two women who lived in the most rigid solitude within a narrow cell, but who, out of respect for his sacerdotal office, permitted him to enter. He found them loaded with chains, which the strongest men could scarcely have borne, and one of them literally bowed down upon the ground beneath the weight and unable to move. Their existence was passed in this state. The most remarkable memoir in this work is that of <clears throat> St. Simeon Stylites, originally a peasant of Cilicia, who fixed his abode on the top of a pillar upwards of 36 cubits in height. The life, however, which he led upon this exalted pinnacle was by no means an idle one. He delivered public exhortations twice a day and according to report, performed the most extraordinary miracles, so that those who were diseased went to him and were healed. He had judged differences and performed all the functions of a judge. He had much influence in the transactions of public affairs and frequently wrote to the emperor, to persons in authority. It was by him also that the affairs of the church were regulated that the future success of any enterprise was determined, and that the arguments of pagans, Jews, and heretics were confuted. The style in which his history is written may almost be called bombastical, and the author, by way of giving dignity to his subject, frequently compares his heroes to the patriarchs and prophets of old. Yet this history cannot but be pronounced useful. For the deluded men of whom it treats occupy a very prominent place in the records of those periods in which they lived. They held the place of highest esteem and veneration of the public and were not unfrequently called from their solitary and comfortless cells to the head of the largest and most important diocese. Iranistus or polymorphous work which derives its name from being designed to combat error under many forms or shapes. Two persons are introduced as conversing on the subject. One proposes questions and starts objections. The other defends the truth. The doctrines mainly advocated in these doc dialogues may be briefly summed as follows. Jesus is both man and God. The human and divine nature are united in one person, yet these two natures subsist without mixture or confusion. At the end of the dialogues is a synopsis of the arguments previously advanced, arranged in a scholastic form. The dialogues themselves are written in an easy and familiar strain and are intended for general readers. The style of the whole work is clear and logical. The objections of the opponent are brought against them, though not always very convincing, may it be said, on the whole, to give indications of strong reasoning powers. Another work on <clears throat> heresies. The treatise gives a detailed account of the errors held by various heresy arcs and sects. Four volumes, one devoted to these descriptions, arranged not chronologically, but as it were, in classes according to subject. In the fourth volume, there are some very severe strictures against Nestorius, but their authenticity is doubted. Theodore drew his materials for the compilation of this history from the most esteemed writers, St. Justin, St. Irenaeus, St. Clemens of Alexandria, Origen, Eusebius of Palestine, and several others as his authorities. 
The fifth volume is annexed, containing a clear and eloquent statement of the doctrines of the church as opposed to the heretics. <clears throat> fifth, a series of ten discourses on providence, which have been pronounced the finest productions on the subject that have been handed down from iniquity. The first of these discourses treats on natural theology, constantly referring the skeptic to the works of God, to the sun, moon, and stars which he has made. It seems probable that they were sermons prepared by Theodore for the benefit of some particular congregation, but the power of analogical reason which they exhibit as well as the brilliant eloquence of the style, render them permanently valuable. Six, the twelve discourses on the cure of the pagan, pagan errors, a work in which the classical airy edition of Theodore is more fully displayed than in any other. Here he quotes upwards of a hundred writers. The style is very elaborate. The author evidently endeavored to imitate that of Plato. These discourses were suggested by public disputation, which he frequently held with heretics of different denominations. Seven, Discourse on Charity. This is considered to have been intended as the conclusion of the work entitled Philotheus, which has been already mentioned. It extols love and charity exhibited by those who suffer for the faith. Number eight, the Sermon on St. John. Number nine, the confutation of St. Cyril's 12 chapters. It must be observed that Theodore does not here combat any of the doctrines received as orthodox, but that he merely attacks the mode in which these doctrines are enunciated. Number 10, fragments of a book against St. Cyril. 11, letters of Theodore. These were very numerous. They are generally arranged in the following order. Letters um, to Sporatius, a fragment letter to John, Bishop of Germanica. Three letters written during the time of the Council of Ephesus. Four, some letters written in the time of negotiation of peace. Five letters written after the peace. All these are divisible into two classes that relate to the disputes with the bishops of Egypt. Well, I hate this stuff there, but we must. So we now turn, we're still in Advent. Great season of the year. Oh, this one is just grand. Seventh, 16th century hymn. The sleepers awake. A voice astounds us. A shout of rampart guards surround us. Awake, Jerusalem, arise. Midnight's peace, their cry has broken. Their urgent summons clearly spoken. The time has come, O maidens wise. Rise up and give us light. Bridegroom is in sight. Alleluia. Your lamps prepare and hasten there. That you, the wedding feast, may share. The second coming of Jesus. Let's pray. Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him that sits upon the throne, the omnipotent Lamb of the tribe of Judah, the Lion and the Lamb, our Redeemer. Amen. Godspeed.